You know, our culture tells us that here's what success looks like. You've got to have a position where you have power. You have to have money, lots of it. You have to have uh, popularity in society. That that's what, that's what makes you successful. Jesus says, not so fast. Hold on. We are in a series where we're, we are seeing from the Gospel of Luke how Jesus gets us reconsidering what success is. And Jesus says, really, basically, whatever popularity, whatever money, whatever position or power that you have, that's not success. Those are tools. Those are tools that you can use in your life to make others successful. So at the end of your life, you'll be able to say, look at the impact of my life. I was successful because I didn't keep all this for myself. I impacted others with my finances, with any popularity or position of power that I had. Now, today, today, that's what we saw last weekend. Today, Jesus is going to help us see what it takes to get us there. All right? Now, watch this. Luke 14, if you have your New Testament and you're tracking with us, it starts in verse 25 saying, a large crowd was following Jesus. This was at a time in Jesus' ministry where more and more people, multitudes, crowds are following. So you got to ask why. Why are a large number of people following Jesus? Now, a lot of them would if you took a microphone and you interviewed them and you said, why are you following Jesus? A lot of people in that crowd would say, because he's, he's the son of God and I, 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 I hear his teaching and it restores me to God. I, I trust him with my future. But there were also a lot of people in that large crowd who if you put the microphone in front of their mouth and said, oh, why are you following Jesus? They would answer things like this because I want to see miracles and signs and wonders. Someone else might say, I heard that he's a healer. I'm hoping that today he does another healing. I want to see a healing in real time. And then there are others, you know, you, you go and you say, why are you following Jesus? Well, I was on the mountain when he took the loaves and fishes and multiplied them out into a, a, an all-you-can-eat seafood buffet. And I, I can't wait to see what he's going to miracleize up for lunch today. So I'm, I'm following Jesus for all of those reasons. It sort of reminds me of... Uh, uh, an email I received just uh, a matter of days ago. It was inviting me to attend this prosperity seminar and uh, from Fire and Gold Ministries. It said, position yourself for greatness. That, that sort of was the mentality in this crowd. And by the time you get to Luke 14, Jesus is so successful that the one of the gospels says that that they wanted to force him to be the Messiah King. You know, if you, there was no need for television debates, no dispute about ballots. Jesus is King. They just wanted to make him King because to them, to the large crowd, to a lot of them in the crowd, following Jesus looked like nonstop daily blessing and success. Who wouldn't want to follow Jesus? You know, I was returning some license plates at an Ontario motor vehicle, uh, and you know how you wait, and you wait, and you wait in the line, right? Well, there was a pamphlet there on the stand, and it says, how's your driving? It said, safe driving for seniors. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, why would you be interested in something that's only going to affect you way down the road in your life? And thank you for thinking that. <laughs> but it turned to page two, and it says, ask yourself these questions. As a senior, if you're a driver, ask yourself these questions. Do family members express concern about my driving ability? I thought, well, they've been doing that all my life. All right. Secondly, do I get lost or disoriented on familiar roads? Third, am I experiencing an increasing number of near collisions? <laughs> Whoa. And then fourth, do... Do other motorists frequently honk at me? <laughs> this was Jesus' situation. He had all these people driving down the road with him, following him, but they're, they're totally oblivious to what the real mission is, to where he's really going. 
Just like, you know, some people can get out there on the road. How many have met some of them on Toronto's 400 series highways and they think they're driving very safely? And you look and say, they're driving dangerously. But they seem to be totally oblivious to it. Jesus is a bit like the successful billionaire who decides he's going to look for a life partner to share his life with. But every woman that he encounters, he always has that question in the back of his mind, is she interested in me because of my money or because of who I really am? Jesus is in that situation. He's got people just following him because of what he can do for them. And, and here he is, left heaven to come and die so that our sins could be forgiven and we can have eternal life. So, something so much greater than a, a temporary healing or miracle or free fish and chips for lunch. And, and yet this, these people are just, just wanting to follow him. I mean, who wouldn't? Who wouldn't? You know, the benefits package, health care, you know. Food, miracles. So, so, so how is Jesus going to fix this? How is he going to get across to these people that you don't follow him for selfish reasons, that he is the opposite of selfishness? He's here to get rid of selfishness because it's destroying our lives and society and our future with him. So how is Jesus going to fix it? Well, you know, he's got to say something that will get their attention that will really jolt them to look at their lives and why they are following him. And does he ever find the words? All right? Get ready. Put on your mental seat belts. Listen to what Jesus says. A large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, If you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father, your mother, your wife, your children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. Otherwise, you cannot be my disciple. And if you do not carry your own cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. How many know there's people in the crowd that say, Oh, this is not what I signed up for. You know, where's the free food? Where's the miracles and the healings? What are you talking about, Jesus? And it gets us thinking, especially we've got to go back and revisit that word hate because Jesus, if anyone championed love, it was Jesus. Jesus said, you love everyone, you even love your enemies. And so what's he talking about here? And then he says, you even hate yourself. Is Jesus uh, talking about self um, disdain, self-abhorrence? No, he's not. It's obviously not what he's saying. He's the one that said, love everyone, including your enemies. Honor your parents. Love God and love your neighbor. Uh, watch this. Love your neighbor as yourself. So you can't really have a, 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 a healthy love of neighbor unless you have a healthy love of self, which is the opposite of selfishness, is seeing yourself valued by God in his image here on the planet to make a contribution. I love myself. I love the future I have with Jesus. So, so what's that word hate doing in there? You know that the English translations of the Bible that we have today any language we have, it's all translated from the Greek language. The Greek word for hate used here by Jesus is misio. It's not a reference to feelings of malice or animosity. It's expressing a supreme priority. It's, it's where you love someone so extremely that every other person you love is in a distant second place. Now, doesn't that make sense? Because Jesus knows that only he can love us to the full capacity of where we can be loved. That deepest part of us is spiritual. Only Jesus can get love into the deepest part of us. Jesus Christ is the only one that is designed to be put into first place in our lives. He's the only one that has what it takes to handle first place in our life. It's unfair of us to ask someone else to have the perfect love that only God has, that only Jesus has. Listen, and then if you love someone more than Jesus, you're being unfair to that person. 
because they don't have what it takes to meet the, the deepest needs of your being. You're a spiritual being. Only God can meet the spiritual needs of your life. It's unfair to look to another person to do for you what only God can. You know, it's like this girl that said to her guy, she said, I, sometimes I'm happy, sometimes I'm blue. However happy I am depends entirely upon you. It's, a, it's not fair. Not fair for any human being. People cannot supply mother, father, sister, brother, even grandchildren. <laughs> cannot supply what only God can. The only being in the universe that has what it takes to uh, supply the deepest spiritual longing that we have and give us permanent love is Jesus. But watch this now, because here's what Jesus is saying to the crowd. To experience love at that level, what does it cost you? Everything. All. Now, the Apostle Paul really got this. He says, you know, you just sort of see how he got this. Look at, he says, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All right, now let's get back to the crowd in Luke chapter 14. Has Jesus shocked them? They're just sort of recovering from what? I have to give up everything? By comparison, consider a hatred of people that I love compared to my devotion and love to you? And then Jesus tells two stories to say, yeah, 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 and you better count the cost. You better calculate the cost before you follow me. Here's how he says it. But don't begin. Don't begin following me until you count the cost. He says, for who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there is enough money to finish it? In other words, don't start building what you can't afford to finish. You know, how many of you, when it comes to Christmas or Thanksgiving meals, those big meals that we have together, although this year might be with a much smaller group, but you, you calculate the calories, right? And uh, that's what we're going to do. Yeah, we're going to help you. You know, uh, so Pastor Keith, we've got some options here for you. So, to, you know, kind of pregame, you, can, you know what to go after and where you're going to pay for it, okay? So... So we got some vegetables first. You can choose between, you got the uh, Brussels sprouts. They're a big fan favorite. This dish is 60 calories. Okay, so you're counting that cost. It's about 2.25 kilometers of a bike ride. Two and a half kilometers on a bike. Okay. Yeah, okay. And then we got the, the sweet potato pie with the marshmallows on top. One slice, this is a little bit more than a slice. So one slice is 367 calories. Whoa. That's 14.2 kilometers on a bike. 14.2 kilometers on a bike to wear this off. Yeah, okay. so you got you know. All okay. right, my wife can make Brussels sprouts taste almost as good as that. I'm going with Brussels sprouts. Okay, there you go. So that's your first choice. Second one here, you got your turkey slices. Now, this is not legit turkey slices, but you know what I mean. It's good enough for us. One, one turkey slice, skin on everything, 53 calories. That's 200 push-ups. 200 pu oh, no problem. Okay, so okay. that's how much you have to pay. Now, this guy, you know, you think tofurkey. You think, okay, that's a healthier choice. Well, the recommended serving is one-fifth of this tofurkey, which is 340 calories. Okay? Whoa. That's with the gravy. And Whoa. that's 1,000 push-ups. Okay, I'm going for the turkey. Going for the turkey. Okay, Brussels sprouts, turkey. There's kind of no option here. I know you're going to take the pie already. Love pumpkin pie. Which is 560 calories for the slice. That would, to burn that off would be about four hours of teaching. Four hours of teaching? No problem. No okay. problem. I'm calculating the savings, putting, I'm going to, I can teach that one. Okay, now I know you like whipped cream. So uh, one it. serving of whipped cream is 25 minutes of teaching. That's about today's teaching today is one serving of whipped What's cream. What's one serving? That's about this much. That's 25 minutes of teaching. 25 to, minutes of teaching okay, right okay. there. Okay, I can do that. Okay. Yeah. yeah. No, but I can do more than that. I can teach long. So I know, yeah, this is more your, your style of How many cream, online right? would say he can teach too long, you know? <laughs> oh. That would be more your serving of a cream, yeah. right? How, how long do I have to teach? Way too long. We don't have time for that. No, so I'm down for it. I'll take this one away. No. Okay. Okay, so calculate the cost. 
Jesus said, you don't start building something until you realize I've got enough to finish this off. He says, don't start building what you can't afford to finish. Then Jesus tells a second story to illustrate this. He says, suppose there's this king who's being invaded by another army. The other army is twice as big. They have 20,000 soldiers, Jesus says. You only have 10,000 soldiers. He said, come on. This is a suicide mission. Calculate the cost. He's basically saying, don't start a war unless you have the power to win. You count the cost. Then Jesus gives the punchline to both stories, and he says, you cannot become my disciple unless you give up everything. Now, what does that mean? Just give up everything. I mean, I can say it globally like this. Watch this. It's giving up every part of your life. It's giving up your all to a God who loves you so much, he gives his all for you. Yeah, but come on, be more specific. Okay. Glad you asked me to. You know what it'll cost you to follow Jesus? It'll cost you your selfishness. Selfishness is the opposite. That, that's following Jesus for what I can get out of it instead of following him because he is God and I want to be right with God. I was made for God. It'll cost you shallowness. Because you were made as a spiritual being, more than to be, uh, you know, in a, in a family, more than to be, uh, you know, successful yourself, material success. All those things are superficial compared to what you were made for. You were made for spiritual success. You were made for God, to long for Him, to have spiritual satisfaction that only comes from Him. And then... And then it'll cost you something else. It'll cost you not only selfishness and shallowness, it'll, it'll cost you short-term living. Because that's another thing about you as a human being. Different from all the animals, you were made to live forever. When you leave this body behind, that soul of you was made to have what Jesus called everlasting life. You were made to live forever. And so you, you give up short-term living to have it. I love what my predecessor, the former lead pastor before me, before Pastor Jonathan Smith, Pastor Stuart Mulligan, he, he said it this way. He says, the only things that God wants you to give up are things that you're better off without anyway. Isn't that the truth? We're better off without selfishness, shallowness, and short-term living. And Jesus, like he did for the crowd, will do for you, and he'll do for Keith Smith. He, he, he'll just, he just, every once in a while, he'll just turn to us and, and say, you know, you've experienced this success, and now you're, 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 you're sort of going off with that, and you got possessive of it, and you're finding your fulfillment in something that's not going to last. And, and so Jesus will turn to me and say, you know, uh, do, do you love me, Keith, more than this? Remember he turned to Peter on the shores of Galilee after Peter had failed and Jesus trying to get him to leave the failure behind and Peter's down on himself. And then Peter says, well, what about these guys? What about their future? And Jesus says, you know, Peter, do you love me? Don't worry about them. Do you, you follow me? Do you love me more than, than these? Every once in a while... And I followed the Lord for decades. I may look young, but I followed him for decades. And every once in a while, he'll turn to me and he'll say, Keith, do you love me more than that? More than your success? Maybe more than a trial you're going through where you don't understand what I'm doing in the world. You don't know my big plan and you have to trust me. Do you love me enough to trust me more than your confusion of what you're going through during even a COVID time? The plans that have been sideline? Do, do, do you love me? Do you love me? Is your love for me your greatest love? Now, please don't misunderstand what Jesus is saying here. He's, he, he's not saying get up every day and be, you know, a, a, a martyr, have a martyr complex. He has come that we might have life and life to the full. To give us peace and joy and love. So, you know, my wife was uh, having her prayer time last week, and she said, I just got to share with you, Keith, a verse that I came across that I read in Isaiah. Listen to this. The Lord longs to be gracious to you. 
longs to. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. How many know God loves to bless humans? He loves to follow me. I'll heal you. I'll help you. I'll, I'll minister to your brokenness. I'll, I'll give you success in your future, but, but it's going to cost you everything that you have. You know, we're going to end this service today, this Thanksgiving service, blessing you. Every one of you online and in this room in Toronto, we're going to sing a song that's been sung all over the world in all kinds of languages during this pandemic time by church people. The Canadian version of it, you can get online. Some of our vocalists were on it, and we're going to sing it over you to bless you this Thanksgiving Sunday. But we're going to be thankful thankful. Watch this. Out of Jesus' teaching of what he's described to us already, we can be thankful for three things. It may be COVID, Thanksgiving, but we can be thankful for three things. What about this? What about being thankful that Jesus didn't start something that he cannot afford to finish? (laughs) Isn't that great? You know, God and Son in heaven decide they're going to go to earth to do something that will forgive us and give us eternal life. But then they, Jesus gets here, and he, can't, he doesn't have what it takes to finish. How many are thankful that Jesus had what it took to complete the work on the cross and died so we could be forgiven and rose from the dead so we could have eternal life? Jesus, listen, you may be going through something in your life right now saying, God, I'm confused. How's this ever going to turn out? I had these plans, but now they're over here in my education, in my workplace, with my family. And you're going through something. Listen, how many understand that Jesus doesn't start something that he cannot afford to finish? Listen to this scripture verse. He who began a good work in you will carry it through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Doesn't mean we're going to understand it all along the way. But how many know when we see him face to face, we'll understand it all. Listen, if you're facing something now, if Jesus brought you to it, he's going to get you through it. Jesus didn't start something in you that he can't afford to finish. Second thing that we're thankful for is this. Jesus did not start a war on evil that he doesn't have the power to win. Remember that king that had the army coming at him twice the size and he's saying, I, 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 can't, I can't win. Our king did not start a war that he didn't have the power to finish. How many are thankful that on the cross, Jesus defeated everything, including death, anything that would defeat us, Jesus defeated it. And so now we can just say, oh, thank you, Jesus, this Thanksgiving, that whatever I face, you have overcome. Jesus said that. He said, in this world, you will have trials and sorrows, but take heart because I have overcome the world. You know, in the last book of the Bible, Jesus tells us what it's going to look like when you arrive in heaven. When we arrive in heaven, it's not like we're going to be a bunch of defeated uh, believers. We're not going to arrive in heaven as, you know, some dragged in off the battlefield, barely made it soldier of the cross. No, he says to the one who overcomes. To the one who overcomes, I give eternal life. So in other words, between now and when we go to heaven, whatever comes at us in this life, Jesus will give us exactly what we need to overcome because he is the king who has what it takes to overcome every kind of evil. Oh, I thank Jesus today, this Thanksgiving weekend, that he didn't start a war on evil, that he doesn't have the power to win, and he won't allow us to face something that he won't give us the power to win over as well. Listen, and then third, Jesus gave his all, so it's safe to trust him with our all. <laughs> it's, it's so true. Just think about it now. He's saying, trust me with your all. I have to know I can trust you. Well, if it's a God who loves us so much, he has all power, but he also has all love, then he's trustworthy. Paul talked about that when he said, since God did not spare even his own son, but gave him up for us all. I mean, if someone gives up their son for you that they love, Won't he also give us everything else? How many can just pray this right now? Lord, you've given me your all so I can trust you with my all. 